Uh, yeah, so thank you, Ed. Welcome. And hopefully that's everyone basically arriving in this event. So I'm really excited to welcome everyone here today uh, to our session on data interoperability to help us grow agroecological and community food systems. Uh, it's yeah, my very great pleasure to be welcoming our friends at the Data Food Consortium, Miriam and Rochelle, to join us, and also to welcome Vicky Hur to join us as well. And just so happy that everyone is here. Um, just to give a little bit of an overview of how the event's going to unfold. Uh, so uh, basically, we've done a bit of welcoming and housekeeping, but just a reminder of anyone coming in to keep yourselves muted. Um, we'll start off with a bit of context from Vicky Herb of Sustain and myself around why this is important for our sector. Uh, and then we're going to hand over to the Data Food Consortium team, Miriam and Rochelle, who are representing today, to talk a little bit about their journey, how they've been building interoperable short food supply chain systems in France. We'll get, we're lucky to have a little bit of a demonstration of the work that they've been doing so we can help to grasp some of the ideas. And we'll talk a little bit about what potential next steps are. And then we've saved a lot of time around 30 minutes at the end to do questions and discussions. And Kobe is going to host that for us. So uh, without further ado, I'm now going to pass over to Vicky to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the context and why this is important for our sector. So over to you, Vicky. Thank you very much, Lynn, and um, great to meet you all and seeing everybody coming in there. It's going to be a really important meeting. Um, so Lynn asked me to do a little bit of a context. I'll be really quick because the, the real stuff is, is after me. Um, but I think this is so timely. It, it's so important that the um, local food systems and community food systems really um, are able to take advantage and take control in the context of big challenges facing the food systems um, right now. Obviously, the retail system is, is always in flux. There's always changes happening in retail. But right now, it is an extreme process of change. Um, we've got massive changes in how people purchase food. And then they're not loyal to their supermarkets anymore, but the supermarkets are still very dominant. But there are more, more supermarkets now than there were, say, 15 years ago when I was working a lot on supermarket fair dealing, um, because you've now got Aldi and um, uh, Little and others coming in that are, are challenging the, the old um, supermarkets we had. But that doesn't change the situation where they squeeze super, um, the suppliers and the farmers more. So there's still an incredibly competitive um, retail um, uh, system out there but it's been challenged also by direct sales by alternative ways in which people aren't going to the retailer they're getting their food delivered directly and that digital that change in digital and direct sales is shaking things up so much as as will amazon uh, as soon as it gets its hands on um big bricks and mortar in in the uk retail sector which is desperately trying to do um and i think it probably will do and we can see what's happening with people vying to buy morrison's which is uh, you know, one of our biggest supermarket chains, which actually owns its shops. So there's a real attempt to get um, a big box retail into the UK in a big way. Um, but as I said, things are changing. There's pros as well in that, in that people getting things direct, they can direct, get it direct from farmers or through really better food traders. So there's a, there's a, a positive in this um, digital revolution as well as challenges. There's also the absolute imperative that farmers need to change what they're doing. We all know this. Um, the farmers need to be able to diversify their farming systems in order to um, build na nature based systems that tackle pests, diseases, changing climate, soil um, protection. So all those things require farmers to probably change what they grow, how they grow it. And that means they need a supply chain that responds to that that is responsive and that can deal with different kinds of products, products that look different or just different products. So they will have that policy shift thrust upon them as the result of change in policies. The government is now going to be paying public money for public goods rather than just directly for, for being a farmer. Um, but there's also climate um, changes that are happening. So farmers are having to change the policy, change the climate needs, and for their own businesses, they're gonna to have to change and diversify. For that reason, we need 
um, really responsive supply chains um, and practical approaches. So interoperability, I think, is really key to making that work really well so it can scale up and deliver what Sustain is calling for, which is around 25% of our supply chains coming from a better food, farmer focus, better trading, farmer focused trading system. So getting away from the incredibly um, demanding systems that suck the value out of the supply chain so that farmers only get 9% of the food pound that people spend in the UK. We want to move away from that so they can get more of the food pound and that they get a responsive um, farmer focused supply chain. And 25% is what we're aiming for by 2030. And given that it's probably about two to four percent now it's a big ask but we think it's possible in order to do that we need the kind of things like interoperability we need support we need training and advice to farmers and new supply chains growing which they are the better food traders i see are in the audience fantastic initiative to provide farmers with the means to trade on a much better um, uh, system than they are when they're doing into into the um, large scale um, big food industry or big retail or big food service sector. So our work at Sustain is around looking about supply chains. We've just done a big survey of farmers and that's clear from that survey that they need something different. They're looking for something different in order to get better returns, to get better value for what they're um, producing and to be able to change what they're doing. Um, and we're also doing mapping. So this is all part uh, of a, a very big shift in food supplies that um, we need to be recognizing and taking um, the opportunity to dive in and do things differently and to grab the customer base, which has recognised as partly as a result of um, the pandemic and the need to think about where your food comes and think about the healthiness of your food, start to get more local, fresher food from, from suppliers, but to really embrace uh, the opportunities provided by digital systems and operations that can actually allow farmers to reach customers far more easily and better out with the um, draining the the squeezing of the uh, big multiples so this is a really exciting initiative fully support you know what we're trying to do to make it work really well so that um, it can all work together and challenge um, those the norms in the retail sector so I think you know it's just worth um, considering the, the the context in which we're doing this is a big change for farmers so they need all the support they can get but that's useful Lynn. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really good kind of intro into the context in which we're working. I'm just going to add a little bit to this from uh, uh, kind of inspired by my own experiences with the Open Food Network over over the past years um, and uh, some of the philosophy behind what we do, what we're trying to do as well. So. I think that there's just no doubt that what we need to do as a civilization, as a culture, uh, yeah, is to move from uniformity, the strategy of uniformity to a strategy of diversity. And I think we need to do this, not just on the fields, although we definitely need to do it in the fields, but we also need to do it within our supply chains and within our entire economy, with, across businesses, across representation. You know, I don't know whether there are, there's any part of our world that couldn't benefit from this shift from uniformity and towards diversity. But this comes with a lot of challenges. For example, you know, like switching from this kind of uniform farming image where you have a single crop that's harvested at one time uh, and then gets you know, distributed in the way that it does towards an agroecological farming system. If we move in that direction, then we're going to be moving towards smaller harvests to spread throughout the year from uh, more farms uh, spread across the countryside. It's, uh, it's, it adds a lot of logistical challenge to the existing food system and the work that we're doing. So, you know, that's on one side. And then uh, if we're looking at having lots of diverse businesses, then that means lots of diverse software systems, lots of diverse business models, lots of diverse routes to market, lots of, you know, and I think this is really important. I think we need, uh, you know, businesses that we haven't imagined yet, businesses that better reflect what people want, businesses that better reflect, you know, the diversity amongst people and how we want to access our food and uh, collaborate as communities. This diversity uh, is I don't think we've imagined the extent of diversity that we need yet. Um, 
but you know this at the moment we're approaching this for as as a whole bunch of little fish we're all little fish swimming around by ourselves trying to make our own little things work you know if you're a farmer you're trying to find your routes to market if you're a food hub you're trying to organize your distributions and pack your boxes and find your customers if uh, you know, all of the, I think across the food system, all of the businesses uh, and farms, it, you know, so many of us are trying to make it work in our own, as our own individual little fish swimming around, you know, solving our own problems. And uh, the problem with that is that we're easily eaten up by the bigger fish. So, you know, this is, this is what we've seen for so long where, where scale is more efficient, you know, and there, there are a lot of advantages to scale. So, you know, the likes of Amazon with their uh, global logistics network actually have some environmental efficiencies compared to the little fish swimming around by themselves, delivering, you know, doing deliveries and driving past each other with half empty vehicles half the time. There are advantages to scale, but there are also severe disadvantages where most people become workers serving the great masters of the of the business world and that's really disempowering it doesn't it's it's slow it doesn't create the kind of world that we want to live in um, so what i'm really interested in how is how we can achieve diversity at scale and i think it looks something like this uh, where all of us little fish can coordinate more effectively can, more more effectively we can leverage uh, some of the tools that the bit that the big fish use, you know, like having consistent data throughout our systems and a way to enable the data to talk to each other. That's a lot of how Amazon can do its efficient distribution network. So this is really about thinking about how we as a whole bunch of little fish can coordinate uh, more effectively with each other to maybe eat up some of those bigger ones. At least that's the goal and the dream. So uh, with that philosophy in mind. I'm going to stop sharing because we're not doing next steps yet. Uh, and I am going to pass over now to Rochelle and Miriam of the Data Food Consortium, uh, who are going to talk about the incredible work that they've been doing in France to develop these systems there. Uh, over to you. Shall I start, Rachel, or do you start? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> starting Miriam. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. So I'm uh, Miriam. I actually uh, initiated the Data Food Consortium in France in 2016. Uh, I wanted to share with you how it started, uh, maybe it can also inspire. Uh, I was myself uh, trying to build a food hub in a co working space, and I wanted to use the Open Food Network to operate that food hub. But we wanted to work with a, a group, a network of producers who were using their own, software, already selling directly with their own software. And uh, it was hard uh, operationally to just get uh, uh, like um, spreadsheet information about uh, what they had in stock and what we could offer to the member of our food hubs. Uh, so the, the only way to be able to cooperate with them was to make our the two software talk to one another so the information of what is available uh, within the producer network can appear in the shop uh, the food hub shop in the open food network and when i realized that i was like oh, how do we do that we and and some friends told me you have to build an api I, i'm not a technical uh, person so i learned what is an api it enables to connect two software but then I realized if I have to do that for one food hub, what is going to happen with the hundreds of food hubs that are that are using all the software? Do they all the time have to build like single APIs to connect to, to every software to every? So that's how I jumped into this uh, interoperability world. And uh, we have uh, we are lucky in France to have some communities who are working on interoperability for a year now. And uh, we were supported in that journey uh, with the um, um, virtual assembly, they're called, a nonprofit that, that work on, on interoperability. I started to, to share that problematics that I hit, that I had hit with other um, software platform uh, that were operating for uh, like 10 years, like short food chain platforms. They, they were 
three main ones in France, uh, among them the Food Assembly that you might know. And yet, so those three sources them these problematic bits, um, they were like, oh, what's the problem? <laughs> and even one of them had created a, what, what they call the connector. It was some standardized API that they wanted the whole ecosystem to use, but no one was using it because they did it alone. So it was not really answering the needs of the other actor uh, on the field of the other software. And so, um, yeah, like they, they, we were all conscious of the problem. We all shared that we have a problem. We cannot spend our time developing one-to-one -one API that we have to maintain. Then if one software changed, then we have to modify the API so the connection remains. So if one software have like 30 APIs with 30 software, it's going to be unmanageable. And there are uh, like not only platforms that are used by many users, a lot of uh, producers also have developed their own small software. So there is a, a big diversity of software tools used among our short food chain ecosystem. And yeah, so when we were when we shared that we had a problem and we agreed on the problem, it was uh, easier uh, to uh, get around the table to discuss how do we solve this problem together because we cannot solve it alone. We have to sit around the table, uh, share how uh, we share how we manage our data, what uh, how we name things, uh, so we know how we gonna make the data flow from one platform to the other um to be honest it took me one year uh, this discussion it took me around one year because some of them like the food assembly they were um they knew there was a problem but they said it's not my priority and uh, and also at the beginning they said user data are um I, I want to keep the user very competitive advantage. User data are my competitive advantage. So I don't want to make this bridge easier uh, for my users to be able to, to, to flow to some other platform. So at the beginning, it was uh, these arguments that they were sharing. But uh, after some time, um, we, I mean, they understood that the success of each one of us, like each software platform, each company behind each software platform will succeed, even if the whole ecosystem succeed. If we don't manage to uh, make it easier for producers and uh, food hubs to uh, use those software, and especially to use a diversity of software together, we are not going to make the market grow. I mean, we will not uh, grow our sector. Uh, I, I can share a little story. I have some producers who told me, like one uh, meat producer who told me he was checking three times a day the, th the three platforms he was, he was selling uh, on to, to be sure he was not overselling. So how can we just change the scale of our ecosystem if each producer has to check like many times on all the platforms if they're not overselling? Like it's, anyway, it's undoable. An, an so yeah, it took me one year of uh, like convincing, discussing and convincing all those software uh, actors who were like kind of competitors. And, uh, and yeah, we, we decided to, to go in that journey together. And uh, we were really cautious about uh, the rules we set in, in uh, how our uh, collective and consortium uh, is going to work because we are competitor and we don't hide this. We know that. So Everyone is, uh, is conscious about what information uh, he or she shares uh, in those meetings. And it's not an easy journey. Like some of those platforms have uh, taken some distance, like the food assembly, the CEO has changed and uh, have not, not taken one year to convince the new one. The new one is much more, I want to succeed alone. So uh, for now, at the moment, the food assembly is not around the table, but new and other platforms have joined. So um yeah so we know that for the standard to be uh working we need the enough platform to adopt it so it's important for us to keep a, a community around the project and uh, and we are pretty lucky because there are more and more platforms who are getting interested by what we're doing i maybe that's enough 
Thanks, Miriam. Um, I will jump from here. So, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Rachel. I'm also a part of the Data Food Consortium as one of the facilitators. Uh, and also, um, I'm part of a platform called Cop Circuit in France. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for the to the whole Open Food Network team for, for this. We are really grateful. Um, so very quickly, I'm just going to um, um, dive a bit more uh, into detail in what we do, who we are. And uh, with Miriam, we are going to, um, to show you, well, very practically what our standard is about. And we are going to do a, a little demonstration to uh, illustrate this. Uh, so just to introduce the topic and, and really quickly summarize what Miriam said, um, we choose and we are going to, to talk today, no surprise, about interoperability. So what is interoperability? It's um, really uh, the power for two um, machines, computer systems to communicate. And I will use this often because I'm not sure how to pronounce interoperability in English and I don't succeed at it. Um, so saying that, we have many ways to achieve communication between systems. Like Miriam said, we can, two systems can actually communicate together by building bridge. If I'm using a metaphor for languages, let's say you have one person speaking English and one person speaking French, in order for them to communicate, they can use a translator. So this is uh, what, what we are looking at when we, we say we build bridges between platforms. Like Miriam said, again, this is not something that can scale. The more there are platforms, the more we need bridges. Um, another way to achieve uh, communication through platform would be to use an already existing standard. And um, that's one of the findings uh, that we had so far in France is that uh, a standard that can apply to short food chain system is not something that exists, or at least we haven't found. So if uh, anybody here knows some, some other standards, please share. We are really open to that. Um, and um, also, choosing an existing standard um, can also, when, when there are no other standard existing, can be achieved with using um, a, a standard from an exist, existing platform. Um, and so it could be a solution saying, okay, um, everybody is using mainly this platform. So we are all going to model our, um, our communication system uh, through this. So you can relate to the big fish problem Lynn said in, in the introduction. If we are using the model of a really big fish that we are not aligned in terms of values, uh, it, it really, uh, it's really a problem. And also, um, it doesn't work with the short food chain system where we have also many platforms because there are many models. We have CSAs, buying groups, food assemblies, et cetera, et cetera. So all these platforms have specificities because there are many specificities to work and sell in short food chain systems. That's our sector. Uh, so we need to work with that. So this is why um, we created this consortium to work and build an open standard. That means two things. Everything that we are producing is published under an open source licenses. And also, we are building a governance around it so that tomorrow, if a new platform emerges, they can choose to build something and, and use our standard. And they can also come in and join and build the standard with us because the standard is something that lives um, and that is iterating constantly to, to be close and useful for the platform using it. Um, so yeah, so just so you have this in mind and how we are working and, and why we build something um, from scratch. Also, this way of working is not something that we have invented. Um, you have many standards in, in many different sectors, not only the web. And of course, we are really inspired but by web standards that are already existing, especially for, for technical solutions that we are using. One specificity where I will um, very um, stretch very much about is that um, in our values were, was uh, this idea to empower farmers and producers and managers of picking points and so on, all actors in our short food chain system to keep their data and, and, and choose with whom they are going to share their data. 
So this is um, really what, what motivates us. Um, and we have now technologies that enables us to do that, to really decentralize data and allowing the user to choose what to do with this data. So this is to say, because often when we present our initiative, people say, oh, so you're an open data uh, initiative. So actually, no, we have absolutely nothing against open data, but we are building a standard to communicate. Um, and the data that are communicated could be data published under open data li license, but also could not. It's really up to the users to, well, share the data how they wish to share it. Um, and also what's interesting is that um, we we will see, but our technical standard is really, uh, so like I said, um, um, inspired and built on web standards that allow the data to be decentralized. And so for example, we haven't looked into a technical solution like blockchain, um, especially because in a blockchain system, actors are using a data that is replicated and, and there are other problems that are, are solved by this, like traceability and so on. In what we are building, we are fetching the data where the data is stored. So it's actually stored only at one place. This is a very, very um, short uh, introduction to, to these uh, main values uh, that we built and worked on. But um, if you have questions, of course, we are going to cover them. Um, uh, afterwards. Um, and yeah, uh, again, so really to wrap up, uh, we are, our main mission is to help the short food chain system to change scale. And we hope that by building an interoperability standard, we will be able to um, uh, really increase efficiency uh, in, in the sector and allows for future innovation and, and more cooperation among the actors of of the system. Um, I think we could now uh, dive a bit more in details into uh, what we have produced so far. So I will let Miriam present a bit uh, the, the standard and I will then do a demonstration and we will come at the end again uh, on governance and, and business models and, and this type of questions. Um, Miriam, over to you for presentation of the standard? Yeah. So when we sat around the table, the first thing we did was to agree on uh, how we describe our job. And we took two years to do that. It seems easy, but it's not so easy. Like every platform used their own words to describe things. And sometimes they use the same words to mean two different things. And sometimes they use uh, two different words to mean the same thing. So we had to really uncommit all that. And uh, so, yeah, we, we met like two hours every two weeks and we uh, iterated. So we uh, started with uh, like uh, the product. How do we describe products? What are the different type of products? How do we organize sales session? How do we... Uh, uh, capture transactions, how do we organize delivery, how do we manage uh, traceability and all those kind of things. We did that based on some use cases because you could describe the word doing that. So to, to, to build a scope, like to be conscious of a delimited scope, we, um, we decide, we choose some use cases and the first use case we choose was how platforms can share producers catalogs like to avoid a producer to have to re um uh, fill a producer catalog in a new platform each time he, he or she sells uh, on a new platform so um this we call the semantic ontology an ontology is yeah, like this uh, agree on a vocabulary on how we describe our work uh, and we uh, did uh, what we call instantiation. <laughs> it's a bit of a technical word. When we, we modelize uh, uh, like the job we do, and then we uh, test this with a really field concrete case with a food hub describing how they operate. And we see, does it fit our model or not? If not, we review the model. So we've done that uh, several times to, um, to achieve uh, some uh, model that we are happy with. 
So this is uh, what we call the business ontology. We describe our business, our job. And we did that also for product. How do we know that a product sold on one platform is the same product uh, as another product on another, on another platform? Because they might, they will not have the same ID, like technical ID. And sometimes even the producer will not have given exactly the same name. Sometimes, yeah. So as, as most of the producers don't use the, you know, GS1 uh, barcode uh, jet in thing, uh, we need the way to reconcile products. So we thought of facets, how, like how would describe private product given some facets, uh, like the nature of the product, uh, is it a carrot or a tomato, what type of carrot or tomato, do we talk about the whole product or just the root or just the leaves and these kind of things. And then we have a technical ontology that uh, enable platform to uh, communicate, like to, ch to share uh, data. It's like uh, representing a, a concept on a given platform, because uh, we are not yet uh, where Rachel just said, for now, the data is not just stored in one place. For now, it is replicated in some platforms and even with, um, and uh, like it's not reconciled, there are different dif differences on the way it is on, on the different platform. So we needed that third uh, technical ontology to, to do that. And uh, above the, um, the semantic ontology, we have a technical protocol. The different platforms have agreed on basic protocols on how data are going to be shared, uh, like regarding the, the safety of the data, how, um, how, um, yeah, how identification, authentication of users are managed uh, toward this uh, federation of platform that share the same standard. That, that's it. I'll share a link if you want to see how it looks like. And it is, of course, a, a living process. We are, uh, yeah, oh, that's it. So you, you find it on the Git book of that of a consortium. Uh, we are at the moment having a big uh, strategic reflection on this ontology. Uh, uh, are we going to keep it or to try to converge with another uh, ontology to, because it needs uh, a community to maintain an ontology. So we are also, uh, in this uh, permanent uh, reflection on uh, how we evolve uh, this ontology. Thank you, Rachel, for the illustration. That's it. Great, I'm taking over from there. Um, I know it's a lot to process, uh, but um, we'll be there in, in the Q&A session to, to dive a bit more in detail. So now we are going to illustrate this because like Miriam said, so this is um, basically the vocabulary on where we are standing. And um, so this took two years. Um, all the actors around the table say, yes, this is the correct way to describe our system. This is where we want to go for the standard. But we didn't know if this was working uh, in real life. So uh, we, we gathered around to build a prototype in order to see if our standard was working. So this is going, this is what I'm going to show you. This prototype is focusing on some use cases. There are two main use cases we wanted to, to look at. Of course, there are many more that the standard can, can answer. The first one was how, as a producer, uh, can I see my product catalog in one place and update the information there so it, it's updated on all the platforms I'm selling my products. And other use cases are more linked to logistics. Um, of course, in an ideal world, we would have had the resources to tackle all the use cases at the same time. Unfortunately, uh, they are a bit linked together, so we needed to go step by step. So. Currently, our prototype focuses only on the product catalog, how to read a product catalog and how to update it. And in the next steps that we are going to face uh, next year is how we are going to uh, manage all data linked to orders. And of course, all this uh, gives data to play and see if our standard works for all the logistics use cases. A last comment before I move on to the demonstration itself. Um, it's really a prototype, again, to um, be able to see if our standard works and to iterate on our standard and make it more robust. So it means that we are 
not focusing on front end sexiness of the wall <laughs> app we are building, especially also because so far the consortium is not about building apps, it's building a standard. Um, we will see what the consortium will be in 10 years, I cannot <laughs> tell you that, it's an open governance, but uh, for now we are not, uh, we're not here uh, to build another platform, um, we are just here to show and, and, and provide the market with, uh, with a standard that people can use. The prototype is um, published under open source license, so if really an actor wants to build upon it, they can, but um, again, uh, this is not what is our mission here at the Data Food Consortium. So this is important to keep in mind. So the demonstration. So for the demonstration, I will ask you to think of me not as Rachel part of the Data Food Consortium, but Rachel, a producer. And I'm producing eggs. Um, this is very, very important. And I will um, lead again at the end if I forget. Um, please ask a question about it while um, I'm doing this de demonstration as a producer. And as a producer, I want to be able to read my product catalog in that comes from dip different places into one single place. And I'm going to show you live how I um, log into this prototype, how I can read um, the catalog that I have on one platform already because I already uh, did the this synchronization before the webinar. And, um, and then we are going to um, link another platform to the prototype and we are going to um, link to my box of 6x on two platform and link them together so that the prototype knows that this is the same product. So this is really a scenario based on what we are seeing in France and what Miriam said in the context, we have lots of producers that are already on several platforms. So this is the context of the demonstration. All right, so moving on to the live platform. First thing um, that we needed to work on, as Miriam said, is authentication. So if I log in on one platform, then I should be able to log in on the other platform um, providing all these platforms have um, accepted the standard, building API to the standard, and th therefore enabling me to authenticate myself because I'm, I'm the producer, I'm the farmer, I own these data. So where, wherever I am, wherever these data are, I should be able to, to act on them. So we needed um, a common um, uh, authentication platform. To do so, just very shortly, we, we had we made a partnership in France with Les Communs. So it's a non-profit organization um, that is um, advocating and um, building commons um, in France. And they, as many of their services, they have um, authentication server uh, that they are um, giving uh, to open source projects. Um, so for the technical people out, out there, we are using an OIDC, OpenID Connect um, um, authorization methods. And so this is an, author an authorization server that we are using here. So I'm logging into the prototype through this um, server. And on this prototype, like I said, I already put um, some um, some sorry i'm moving your the zoom box because i'm not seeing anything um oops some products uh from another platform where i have uh, products which is called le Cog libre and like i said i want to um also see in the prototype products that i have on a platform called suclio so, so Clio is um, a big platform in France, especially that's spe specialized in catering products. Uh, if you want to know more about them, um, I can uh, tell you a bit more. So uh, I will log in um, into so Clio's platform and you can see, so sorry, it's in French, but I, I, I clicked on logged in, logging in and I have several ways to log in. And one of them is to log in with Les Communs, so the comments. Uh, here. And when I do this, I'm instantly there on Suclio because on the same browser, I was logged in in the, in the prototype with 
this authorization. Uh, so on Seclio, I have products, like I said, a um, couple uh, of them, and I want these products to be showed also on the prototype. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the prototype to fetch those products. So we're using here a word called import. And um, so if you follow closely what I said before, we are not looking actually to copy products. But to start our prototype, we, uh, we started with uh, just playing with copying fake data uh, to go faster. And uh, one other step for the prototype will be to just um, access the data on the server where it is. Uh, when I do that, the prototype is telling me, OK, uh, you have all these products from the Socleo platform. So you can see that here I have the same product that I, I have here. Again, sorry, product name in French. Um, French people doing stuff in English, <laughs> always halfway. Um, and um, so these products are so it's a very particular um, technical word that we are using when we are working, non-reconciled. So we are using the vocabulary linked, but in semantic web, we, we talk that uh, data are either uh, um, consigned, uh, reconciled or just uh, living together um, in the independently. Um, so for now, um, the prototype doesn't know if these products already exist in my in my catalog. So I'm going to tell him that these eggs here, this box of six eggs, is actually already in my catalog. So I'm going here and I'm searching for my eggs. I see them here and they are. So I'm on the product that is coming from Suclio. And here I see the product that is on the code Libre. And I am, I'm going to tell the prototype, hey, those two products are the same. And now in my main catalog, I can see that when I look at my eggs, I have indeed managed to link the two products. So it doesn't look like much, like you, you can just see um, a tree presentation, but behind it's much more interesting because now the prototype can say um, that this product has links in other platform, has realities in other platform. And this information, um, the prototype can share it with as many platforms as we wish. And this is really um, what we were trying to build. We are kind of a catalog of links. Um, and here I'm using a prototype to do this, but tomorrow two platforms that want to talk to each other can just actually um, comply to the standard and then do everything they want um, and talk without needing a third party. So this was also very important for us. We didn't want to recreate um, a middle man in, in, the, in the mix. Uh, just to finish, so as you see here, I'm just reading data. Uh, and some of them, yeah, we are not very um, imaginative for using test data <laughs> so far. Um, but we are actually working this summer on addition. So that means that if I want, I could change my stock limitation for the product on Suclio or say, or tell the, the prototype, for example, hey, just change my stock on all uh, platforms. And um, and of course, we haven't um, used all data uh, looking at the product. Again, we are um, moving forward step by step. So, so far, we didn't need pictures, um, uh, prices, because again, we were only um, we were only working on the uh, stock limitation use cases. When we are going to orders, we are, of course, going to integrate prices, offers, customers, um, and, and then moving on to more logistics uh, information. And, uh, and just to finish on where we are with our play playground, as I said, I was logging in as a producer. So I, uh, everything that I did here is a producer. Of course, we know that producers, farmers don't have time to do what I just did, just matching products. We know this is not going uh, to be like this in reality for two reasons. First, um, if we are successful, 
well, we don't need to link products that are already exist, existing. We're just linking platforms and creating products from one platform to the other. I think this will be 90% of the cases uh, because so far I've, we I think farmers are also reluctant to be on several platforms because it's difficult. And last, last, last aspect in this um, is that um, in many, many cases, um, the platforms will also help the producers through this, either because they, they have a, a, a special link, a special bond with them. For example, so Suclio, like I said, is a catering, is a platform that has many um, um, uh, clients in catering. And what happens in catering is that an order is comes from, a, for example, a school, and this, and then this order is dispatched into all the producers that uh, can. Um, produce the type of product. And so, so Clio has um, a special link uh, with the producers because they are allowed to um, actually answer the order as a platform. So they have more power over, over the data uh, than um, the other platform, but this is really uh, particular. So when we, we say that we want the owner of the data to, to stay the owner of the data and, and be powerful on this, in some cases it, it can not be the producers because the platform is, um, has a special way of, of, of doing so. Um, and to wrap up, uh, we haven't uh, really um, spoke about it, but this is an overview of all members uh, that are participating into our consortium today. We have research partners. I'm sure you already heard of INRARI. Um, I mentioned Sukliu as one of the main contributors in the platform that we saw in the demonstration. Cop Sekui, Mayan mentioned the virtual assembly, uh, which is uh, helping us in facilitating. Um, we have many other platforms that are um, starting to uh, to play with um, their API and, and starting contributing. Other that are, that did formally contribute, like the Food Assembly, which validated really the the ontology, uh, but didn't change the change of team occurred when we started to play with the prototype. And finally, we start to have a, a large working groups regarding logistics, um, many um, optimization, root optimization actors, um, uh, car sharing uh, to deliver boxes, and also the, fr the French um, ecological um, and environmental um, organization that, um, of course, follows this very um, closely and offers us also a, a, a platform to, to facilitate all the actors. As we know, um, logistics is one of the main environmental impact of short food chain. All this is uh, also being made sense of uh, some financial support from the Parisian region and two, two foundation, um, Daniel and Nina Caruso and, and, and the Massive Foundation. We are working around with an annual budget today of around a hundred thousand euro if i'm not mistaken it's something around eighty six thousand pounds um mainly to help us uh, produce the prototype and uh, build and iterate the standard but also um to work on facilitation and communication around our our standard and um of course we don't want to stay on grants forever and we are starting to think about other business model in the future but nothing is um is definite for now and uh, this is only um built and i think i i, I overpassed my time sorry yeah you wanted to say something I, if yeah, i can I'm just sorry. one minute a quick compliment uh given what you said and what you showed in the, in the prototype, Rachel, maybe you can start to imagine uh, around this uh, competition uh, or all these competition uh, challenges uh, among actors around the table that uh, actually it can really enable each one of them, each platform to um, propose new services to their users. I think it's really how we should see that uh, having a standard enable each platform to better serve their users and their clients. And uh, we should really keep that in mind.
Okay, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Rochelle and Miriam. That was a huge amount of information, a very uh, deep and open tour of your journey so far. And that is uh, something that I'm incredibly grateful for. I think um, the kind of understanding of the care and attention and the amount of work that went into the two year process to come up with the kind of first versions of the standard really, to me, shows, you know, that this work, it's, it's not an easy task. And if we leave it up to markets or the big fish, then uh, we will lose. So I'm incredibly grateful that you've done, you know, you've invested so much to get the stand, like a, a standard specifically for short food supply chains to this point. Um, and I'm sure, so I know that within our audience here, we have an absolutely esteemed crowd of people running food tech platforms, people who are running food hubs and community food businesses. We've got a lot of food producers here. We have an incredible amount of knowledge in the room. So uh, I think it's time to open up for questions and I'm gonna now pass to Kobe because you're going to do some coordination and facilitation of these questions. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. It's so great to have you here today. Um, so if you could just pop your questions in the chat and then I'll get back to I'll get to you um, and then if you could unmute yourself and ask your question and we'll go from there. So just to kick things off first, Dil Green, you had a really interesting question. So if you don't mind, uh, if you could pop yourself on unmute and then ask away. Oh, right. Right, no pressure there. Um, what did I say? It was so good. <laughs> um, I'm interested to understand whether the participating systems and networks are intending to build translators to and from the protocol themselves and keep their existing systems uh, as they are, or whether they are thinking of migrating towards this new and excellent protocol and then the the demonstration sort of opened that up in my head a little to the possibility that user-facing uh, apps could do all the translation work if uh, systems just built apis but then that seemed to like propose anyway that that's another knock-on question stick with that question uh, are people intending for all the systems to build bi-directional translators or is it more uh, that they will migrate towards them or are they choosing differently? I can start answering and, and please Miriam and uh, chip in. Um, I think that historically, most of the platforms around the table started doing that. They found a partner in, in for example, uh, logistics, op optimizing routes systems, and they started talking to um, make a bridge and, and work together. Uh, or um, a delivery system, and bike delivery platform and uh, distribution platform, and they started this. And from this experience, what the, the platform saw is that it's super expensive. Um, it's um, it's a soup, it's it's really hard to ma maintain, and it it kind of you're, you're married to to one actor, and maybe this actor has a geographical limit, or, or just um, it it's really hard to find a, an actor that is aligned with your values, whatever, um, and for the same amount of work but one shot you can open up to a whole ecosystem of different actors. So financially, it's it's completely way better to, to just apply to the standard. Um, so all actors around the table um, are committed to follow this rather than um, doing um, bilateral uh, partnership. Um, but of course, for now, the bilateral partnership that exists before remains because they they work. I don't know if it's uh, maybe a, a compliment because I hear in the question of so something about uh, do they keep their own uh, way of describing things or do they uh, also change their own inner way of describing things? So um, for now, everyone like what we say is everyone can just keep their own uh, vocabulary, their, their way of working, and they just have, as Rachel said, to build 
this single API and maintain it, and then they can talk to any other system. But um, what we see is that when uh, working on this uh, uh, job like um, ontology uh, work, they also realize sometimes that something in their inner system is not really well done and maybe they should evolve it. So it's also inspiring every actor uh, on how they could improve uh, the way they work uh, within uh, their system. So, yeah, that's my answer. I think someone asked a question this in the chat around blockchain while well, we didn't yes, do the blockchain protocol. No, that's so awesome. No, thank you so much. Uh, Anthony Cobble, if do you mind asking your question about blockchain? Yeah, so uh, I'm over here in the United States, if you can't tell by my accent. Um, and we have over the last year really come to pretty much all of the same conclusions. I love all of the design goals that you guys have for the spec. I think that. that, that we're 100% aligned that you guys are doing the exact same thing that we've been talking about doing now. Um, but I, specifically, a lot of these design characteristics around data sovereignty and syncing data between multiple um, systems and things like that seem to be addressed by blockchain. And I was just wondering if you guys have put any thought into that. Again, I can start and, and Miriam jump in. Um, so uh, thank you for the question, actually. It's a, it's a question we get asked often and um, we considered it. However, um, in the blockchain system, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hearing myself twice. I don't know if it's the same for, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, and um, in the blockchain system, um, so the data is is um, copied from one actor to a, to another. And and then what blockchain does very well is, is enable traceability with a lot of security around it. And we were more um, focusing on how we can actually use a, system, a technical system where um, the data is, is decentralized, but in one, is in one single point, the point where it's created. So it's created one at, at one place and then it is um, read, used um, according to the producer of the data wishes. So it's, it's a bit of um, uh, another technological standpoint. Um, but yeah, uh, happy to, to talk about this in, in more details and, and see where are the um, bridges that we can make. I don't know, Miriam, if you want to add it. Yeah, we did talk with some blockchain uh, actors, um, but I think, I mean, even if uh, technically we choose a, a blockchain option, you still have to govern uh, this uh, uh, technical uh, uh, tool. And in terms of environment, there is a higher impact. I, I don't really see uh, for now, maybe I'm wrong, but the advantage of uh, using blockchain uh, as we are doing the same. I mean, uh, we, we still need to build a standard, even if you use blockchain, you still need the, that standard and, and you still need governance. And there is higher environmental impact. So, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I, you have some arguments you want to share. On the higher environmental impact um, for this specific application. There's a lot of talk about you cryptocurrencies and proof of work. Sorry, I'm, I have a technical background, if you can't tell. Uh, there, there is a, a lot of talk about uh, proof of work and you know, higher environmental impact of things like Bitcoin. But blockchain itself, if you're already syncing different servers, you're, you're not really having more environmental impact than just each individual actor running their own servers. Well, to be honest, uh, at some point, I remember we did ask the question. I, I, it's, it was a long time ago, so I'm not sure. But uh, if you want, we can have uh, some uh, private conversation about that uh, later on. Uh, I would actually love that because we've been putting a lot of thought into this recently. And I want to, I want, I want to stress that blockchain is not just for traceability. Like it's a public data store, basically. Uh, I, I have a follow-up if I, if I can, while I have the floor, is that okay? Or do I need to wait? Yeah, no, since you're speaking now, go ahead. Okay. 
Um, recently, the Linux Foundation launched an ag-focused project called AgStack. Have you guys heard of this or been involved in it in any way? We've started engaging with it here. Uh, I, I work at uh, Farm Fair, which uh, serves food hubs. Um, we've started engaging with them. And right now, their focus isn't so much in this specific area, but I think that they could use some of this thinking. Um, right now, because of who's, who's running it, they're, they're a little more focused on machine learning um, models and that, collecting data for that purpose, as opposed to serving the needs of the people that are already in the, in the food system, as you guys are addressing. So uh, just curious if you guys have engaged with them at all yet, and if not, I would encourage you to do so. Can you write the name in the chat? I didn't get, I don't think we are yet in that. Yeah, I'll send the name and the link to their, their homepage. Yeah. Perfect, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, so uh, Bob Mayhew, you, you have a really interesting question about how much work it will take to get this off the ground. If you could just pop yourself uh, on mute yeah. and then ask away, thanks. Hi, um, uh, great work, everyone. Um, if we wanted to replicate this in the UK, what, what you've already done in France, I assume this would save a lot of work since much of the groundwork uh, has already been done. Um, like, for instance, we could use the same kind of product language that you've already worked so hard to specify. Is this, is this, uh, is it reasonable to presume this? I, I, I know it wouldn't be completely straightforward, but um, is, is, is there a lot of groundwork done already? Shall I start? Well, actually, a standard has no frontier. So that's why from the beginning, we documented everything in English. Um, but the governance of actors need to be something done locally. So that's how I would see that you can definitely, and you have actually to uh, facilitate a community of local actors and uh, do this work of uh, like uh, sharing the needs, uh, like uh, be conscious of the problem, yeah. like everyone is conscious about the same problem, what are the solutions? And then uh, what Data for Consortium has done, like the standard we have built could be one of the solution that you could investigate and see that uh, meet your need. And if yes, you could join the community and, uh, and we could co-develop uh, that standard. Like you can, if you see there, there are some limitations in the standard, we really want to have a, an open governance and a bit like an open source software, you know, if you have a, you, if your use case doesn't totally uh, fit uh, with the standard, like something is not uh, um, working, you're, you're missing one bit in the standards for your use case to be covered. We, you could, uh, you know, aha, like send a request and we could add this little thing so you can use the standard to, to make your use case. Yeah. So this could be done internationally, but you, you still have, I think you still have uh, to, to facilitate local communities. I don't know, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just a quick add to that. So, of course, we would need to to also build together um, the international governance, but that's something also around the table we are really used to do. So, uh, lots of uh, folks from open source communities. So, this is something that we not we are not seeing as a barrier, but. Uh, actually as a diversity um, that we, we should build uh, upon. And um, just, I don't know if he, he is hearing us, but um, there's someone called Claude Heyman here and he is actually doing this in, in Belgium. So um, there are actually other countries also looking at, at, at this and, and doing eventually the same, building a local governance that can um, um, use the standard and, and, and improve it. And the more people will be around the same standard, the, the, the more powerful will be that standard. Uh, a standard work only if there are many, many people using it. And if we want to be uh, all together this big uh, network fish, uh, we need to cooperate around the same standard at some point. Yeah, just to quickly add, uh, I can see real advantages to uh, you know, to coordinate around the same standard, take uh, the Sail Cargo Alliance, for example, running sail ships that sustainably transport food from small producers, you know, olive oil producers, we can't grow that in the UK. Uh, and so creating some data interoperability that also helps sustainable and effective trade, I think could be really, really powerful aspect of this. And of course, as, as I said, 
Um, for now, we have uh, built our ontology ourselves, but we we are having discussion uh, at an international level with people in the US, especially people from Value Flows, uh, which is a, another ontology of open source community people, like really uh, aligned value people, and uh, and also more conventional uh, people working on standards in the US, uh, like around food standards, like IC foods and uh, uh, people be behind food on which are like uh, standardized vocabularies for food activities and this kind of thing so we are having discussion at this global level at the moment um, and so if we uh, like we really want this standard to be uh, international so if uh, when if, if you decide at some point to, to join and collaborate with us on this standard and there is something that you you think is not well thought. We are really open to to uh, challenge and and evolve. We need that. No, that that's great. Um, I feel that Dill Green has another follow up question, um, similar to what was just asked, but more so on um, how this might play out with with, with the relationship between producers as opposed to a commercial project that might be able to fund such a project. So Deal Green, if you mind popping yourself on mute. Yeah, um, I've read some things about the truly awful practices that businesses like Deliveroo and Just Eat um, use to force local small restaurants and takeaways to use their platform. They mimic their website they you know they do all sorts of strange things so if it ends up in a situation where many many small local food producers are publishing their data in this open standard i'm just being a black hat here um or a white hat because i'm not going to do this i promise um but if you've got a well-funded organization that said all oh, right we will provide local food wherever you are in France, uh, and we will give you the best available choice of local produce. And uh, yes, we are a little bit more expensive in the supermarket, but you'll be super green and supporting your local farmer, and it'll be great. And uh, they kill off all the small community projects. This is a sort of slightly nightmare scenario, which I, I imagine I've only been thinking about it for five minutes. I hope you've got answers to it. Thank you so much for this question. I think this is really interesting. Um, clearly, there, there are already apps doing that, right? <laughs> um, they're doing it with ag aggressive uh, prices um, and, and so on. And um, I, I think there are two aspects uh, to answer this. Um, the first one is if they're doing so while applying the standard, then the producers can easily be also on the small platforms so that well the, the platforms wouldn't lose the the the, the product there uh, they are selling like they are now so this is a, an advantage and also second aspect is of course governance if we we manage to build the the accurate governance around around this the standard and um we really we are really successful in building a community around it, then um, I, th I think um, all the time that, that farmers and producers are not uh, spending on uh, and actually uh, updating their, their stocks and so on, maybe they, they, they can also um, have it on being, um, have more time to think about how their data is um, is shared, used and by whom. So, well, it, it's, it's a bit of a, I guess, uh, uh, I guess, but uh, this is at least how I personally see it. I don't know if Miriam, you want to, yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I would also see that in, in another way. Uh, even big actors have difficulties to find uh, like uh, local producers willing to sell through them. Like, I think it's, I have talked to, to big players in, in France and um, so they would have, like even big players would have interests to adopt uh, that standard uh, to make it easier and uh, to convince small producers to also sell them uh, 
some of the projects and it's it's always like um if there are some surplus like have some flexibility to sell them on different platforms for a producer so they don't lose uh food you know so that they, they don't uh, um waste uh, some of, of the products so uh yeah i, I think it, it would it would be in the other direction they, they, yeah might i have a comeback yeah that's fine um I'm unconvinced by those responses. Uber has as much money as it wants to undercut the prices of taxi drivers all over the world for the next 10 years. It's losing money hand over fist. It's probably a dead company, but it's got so much money in its hands. It's destroying local taxi services all over the planet because of a fantasy about a future monopoly. Your protocol if it's public and open, produces a friction-free runway to build an Uber for local food, I think. My problem with all of these projects is we're all good people. We think about good people. We think about good things happening. We don't employ, we don't work with sociopaths. There are many sociopaths out there. I'm not sure. I... <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so there's there's so many aspects to this. Um, one aspect is that like producers are. It's not just that all the produce is immediately available to sale for sale to anyone who can integrate with it. So actually, producers choose who they sell through, uh, and we can build a community of practice with the values that we want to have for our food system. And this then becomes a question of governance. What is the governance of the organization that enable, you know, that, and I think that's a really important thing to stress that we need to, you can't kind of create an effective standard without exploring the governance around it so that there are a group of people defining the food system that we are creating, a group of people that represent all the actors involved, producers, the sector, uh, the tech platforms, shoppers, like the, uh, this kind of breadth of stakeholder that can define what we're creating so we kind of you know we see both sides of this it does make it easier to think about aggregating on a larger scale so potentially it could supply bigger contracts i would say that that would probably in the governance based on who's here today would lean more towards procurement or something rather than supplying into supermarkets so you have this opportunity to scale up and to aggregate lots of smaller producers into bigger markets in ways that they're not able to access right now but you also have an opportunity to sit around the table and define the food system that we're creating through the governance processes. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, your fears can easily be allayed there. And if I can add also something, because we, we had a lot of discussion about this, uh, I remember now. Uh, if you, actually when you have a standard that comply with the distributed web, um, uh, that Rachel mentioned uh, paradigm, I would say, you it opens up a niche business model, and it's actually very challenging for a monopoly actor because they can't anymore um, uh, capture and close uh, data from uh, from users. So. Um, it's actually, you know, like if I take car share, uh, the, an analogy with car sharing platform, if I can publish my uh, car sharing offer on a, on a third party platform with open standard and any car sharing platform can uh, show it on, on their uh, car sharing offer, uh, then uh, uh, the big monopoly who were having those data within their silo before are, uh, Detroit, you know, so this is also like the, the long term strategic plan is this <laughs> is uh, like um, cut the grass behind the feet of the big players, you can say that in English, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, and we do believe we also believe there is a lot of actor doing doing lobby in the big instances, uh, like the big uh, W3C and the governmental uh, level to um, force, you know, now with GDPR in Europe, you have to 
if you want to get out of a platform, the platform has to give you your data in an interoperable, in an open format. For now, it's in an open format, but uh, tomorrow maybe it will do data also will have to be compliant with distributed web standard. And there are other factors doing lobby in that direction. So, so really there is no friction and, and no platform can enclose, can capture users and data users. So we do believe in this. Yeah, and just to quickly add something, because I think it's related to Pete's question also around, do we have criteria to determine which supplier or which platform are able to use the standard? This is something um, uh, we, we of course need to, to discuss as well. So I, I will just share my personal opinion. Uh, we are building a standard, so it's very different from, from building a, a platform. So for example, we are very much criticized by, by people for adding the food assembly around the table because, well, you mentioned Uber. Well, food assembly on some level can, can be compared to Uber in, in certain way. But I, I disagree to that to that view of, of using a standard. Um, I think Anthony also compared it to, to roads. It's actually like this in my mind is that we have roads outside and there are people we, which are not aligned with our personal values that will use them, but they are absolutely uh, free to use them. And this is the same with the standard. And actually, because they will use it, the standard will be st stronger. We have lots of things to, to, to learn from even Amazon, I think. I think I, I'm sure their logistics is uh, on top. <laughs> so please come and contribute because also what is interesting with this is one thing that we can ask for them is that if you use it, you also contribute to it. Um, because, of course, there will be some stuff that we missed that are missed, miss um, uh, build. So they will need to, to contribute, contribute to have uh, to use it and, and make it work. So this is how I see and it's very personal and I understand um, criteria are important, um, but um, there are always ways to, to look at it, just to open it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have one final question, and I think that was from Pete Russell. So uh, if you could be super quick, Pete, in asking your question, and, and hopefully we can wrap up shortly. Great. Well, Rachel just responded to that. So thank you very much, Rachel. Yeah, I was just referring to criteria um, Probably the, the thought I had in mind with most was that it's a two-way arrangement. If you want access to the data, you've got to provide your data. Um, and so you get the advantage of access to the data via applying that st standard, as long as everyone agrees that your data, you know, that, that, that there is a, a fair way of uh, contributing back. And I imagine in, in, a form of, in a form of data as well. But, uh, but Rachel has, has responded. Uh, maybe if I can and add to that question, because we are not really talking about data, like then it's, it's a two party agreement. Uh, if the agreement between the two party is, uh, I share you the data and you give me money. I mean, that's their, that's their agreement. It's not, it doesn't concern the standard. And, and of course the standard can, in, can enable good and bad. I mean, we don't know what people are going to do with this standard. But what we want is to unlock our ecosystem to do good. I mean, uh, and, and it's fine. If uh, there are also sometimes uh, um, confidentiality uh, issue, like some producers, for example, concerning their sales, maybe they, they are okay to provide and share their data with research uh, institutes or with uh, uh, like uh, local authorities uh, who want to improve the uh, the local ecosystem, but they're like, um, uh, yeah, like sensitive uh, data. So maybe they will share them with a specific actor with a specific uh, license for a certain time. This is, uh, I like to talk about distributed big data. It's uh, really every actor decide what license they put on their data, for whom, for which usage, for which time, and, and it's, they, they really choose what they want to exchange for that. Perfect, thank you so much. I think that's all with our questions and I'll hand over to Lynn. Cool, all right. 
Well, yeah, thanks everyone. It's obviously like a, a big space to explore. I think uh, it was, yeah, just really fascinating to unpack a little bit some of the kind of uh, concerns and probes that we have to have to deal with here, you know, like it is potentially a huge opportunity and like anything, there are also huge risks. So uh, I think it speaks a lot to kind of having these conversations, learning from people who are doing these things and trying it out and actually uh, continuing to explore. Um, and so just to kind of wrap up, uh, I'm going to share my screen again because I have one slide totally worth it um uh and yeah just maybe to start to think about what next steps could look like so i think you know we are keen to continue these conversations as the open food network and we have been chatting to some of the other platforms to continue these conversations um and it's been really interesting as well to chat to particularly community food businesses food hubs and food producers about the potential things that this could start to unlock and the challenges that it could start to solve. So we're really keen to continue exploring what this could look like. And I think, you know, today we focused on short food supply chains, but I think there are conversations here that are equally relevant for other topics in the sector. Instantly, what comes to mind for me is thinking about some of the social and environmental metrics uh, that exist. There are so many of them. They are quite different and dispersed and it's uh hard to compare between them so uh i you know it, i do wonder what it might look like to explore similar processes around some of these metrics and start to create some interoperability between them um but yeah <clears throat> we are working towards a pilot on catalog interoperability uh in the uk we're currently seeking some funding to try that out so i think um yeah, it'll be really interesting to, to continue this journey and particularly focusing on governance uh, and making sure, you know, the right or the we have the people around the table that can ensure that this uh, unfolds in the way that we need it to. Um, and so, yeah, exploring who the partners and collaborators are basically after this session, I'm going to send out a follow up email and we'll send out the recording, but also uh, ways to stay in touch. So probably it'll just be a, kind of making sure that if you want to stay in touch, we've got your permission to stay in touch and give, get a little bit of information about how you might be interested in continuing these discussions. So please do watch out for that because it would be um, really great to continue this journey um, and you know leverage some of the inspiration and great folks that have come today. Um, yeah, and that is all from me so uh, unless anybody wants to jump in and say a quick goodbye or anything like that then i will wrap up the session it has been absolutely fantastic to have this conversation thank you so much for your brave contributions and bold uh and for sticking through it because it was highly technical at times so thank you very much for that and if anybody wants to unmute together and say goodbye, then it's quite a nice way to end these rather than everyone anonymously disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Amazing. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.